minus 60 seconds and counting. Who is your best friend? Who can you come home to and know everything is going to be all right? Who is the one that will always follow you no matter where you might end up? That's right. It's your animal. It's your best friend, your closest companion, your partner till the end. But have you ever wanted to know more? What do they do when you're gone? Why do they do what they do? Or even think about other animals around the world. What do they do? How do they act? Why can't I have one of those? Well, sit back, hold tight, because here we go. Welcome to Animals, Breed All About It. It's a show open from anything from A to Z. It's all about the animals. So, what do you want to know? Where shall we go? Follow us as we dive deep into the animal kingdom. Hello, and welcome to Animals Breed All About It. It's a show about anything and everything from A to Z about animals. Whether it's the small critters in your backyard or the large and in charge animals living around the world. On today's episode, gear up for the winter as local vet Dr. Hood gives us tips and tricks for the cold winter months and our pets. Learn the warning signs on when you should take your cat to the vet. Visit Almost Home Animal Shelter to meet some of the adoptable pets. Travel to the Detroit Zoo to meet their wolf pack. And get introduced to a few of the animal entertainers and organizations that the Novi Pet Expo had to offer. It's all coming up on Animals Breed All About It. The cold is coming, love it or hate it, it's here. But what does this mean for our pets? Dr. Hood gives us the scoop on how to get ready for the winter. Well, I think it's very important that we start planning ahead of time a little bit about um, the winter months and, and what things we can do. So there's really two things. There's a lot of dogs and cats for that matter that spend time outdoors. And so if they're gonna stay outside in the cold weather, it's gonna be very important to have their shelter and their bedding and everything all set up. So if they have a dog house, for instance, or a shelter for your cat, make sure that it's nice and secure. There's no leaks uh, coming in. Uh, one of the things that possible is to have the opening face away from where the wind predominantly blows from so they don't get cold. You just make sure their bedding inside is clean and is thick enough so that they can lay down in there and stay nice and warm. Um, you know, cats in particular, you know, will generally try and seek out places to go, but if they have some place that's warm and has some appropriate bedding, um, then they can, they can go in there. I think the important thing to keep in mind is that's great um, if they thrive out there. The most important thing, if let's say it gets below 20 degrees, they just need to come inside um, and be kept inside overnight and things just to find a place for them indoors, just because that's just too cold for them to be outside. There certainly are plenty of dogs that do better in the colder weather. These are usually going to be your arctic breeds like a Malamute or um, a Husky. Um, those dogs just have a thicker coat and, and were bred to be out in the cold weather. Obviously your smaller breed dogs, short thin hair, um, they're not going to stay quite as warm. But yeah, some of those dogs are going to really thrive out there and love it um, when it's really cold. Before the winter comes, make sure you have an appropriate coat or sweater or something for your dog, especially if they're small, especially if they have short hair. Um, that'll help to keep them warm. The other thing that you can get pretty readily now is a lot of little boots to protect their feet. Their feet are just going to get cold touching the ground, get exposed to some salt and other things like that could, that could be irritating. So having some cute little clothes for your dogs are, are, are great when they're going out for a walk. We do have to be careful with this. Thankfully, they'd have to really ingest a, a lot of these products to really cause them to be sick. Some things, it makes sense to induce vomiting so they don't have exposure. Other things aren't safe to induce vomiting. So you should check with someone first. Um, if they recommend inducing vomiting and you're comfortable doing that at home with some hydrogen peroxide, that would be a good place to start. The vast majority of these need to come in and need to be seen, make sure they're not having any toxic effects and we can do some additional therapies besides just inducing vomiting to minimize their exposure. Um, but it certainly can be very irritating to their paws and in between their toes. You know, they walk and they get the uh, salt stuck in between their uh, paw pads and it's just in there and it can be really a source of irritation. The thing I tell people all the time is after you get back from a walk, uh, make sure you have something available near that door that you can clean their paws off real quickly. That way we're going to not have any salt or ice melter that's going to be an irritant 
and also we're going to um, clean off anything that they could lick their paws and ingest later. So just make sure that's part of your whole winter time thing is to have something by the door to clean their feet with. Yeah, cats can certainly be outdoor cats in the winter time. I, I think we do need to keep this uh, threshold in mind um, as far as temperature. Anything below 20 degrees, they should probably be inside for that night so they don't get too cold. But if they have shelter outside, they really need to uh, have something that is going to be secure and a place they can stay warm. We don't want the wind in there. We don't want any moisture in there to get them cold. Um, that's going to be very, very important in the long run. Water obviously is very, very important, right? You put a bowl or a bucket of water out and it's 25 degrees outside, it's going to freeze pretty quickly and then they're just not going to have access to that. Yeah, you put water out there, but they just can't ingest that because it's, it's frozen. So there needs to be something. Again, if they're going to be outside for extended periods of time, they need access to fresh, clean water, we have to come up with a plan. You know, that might be putting a big bucket of warm water out there that maybe won't freeze for a couple of hours if it's going to be a couple hours. If they're going to be out overnight and all throughout the day, you need to um, probably purchase a heated uh, bowl um, that can um, stay warm enough so that they have access to the water. And the same thing with cats, you know, I mean, we just have to come up with something. If we have a bunch of outdoor cats that live outside all the time, they need to have water and, and they just may have to get a heated bowl so that they can, they can have that access. Well, we see wintertime things, hypothermia, frostbite, Things along those lines are much more common in the winter, and that's just some common sense. Thankfully, a lot of our contagious diseases and other things that we see, fleas and stuff like that, are just not very common in the winter time. So it really is a time of the year where we see less of those types of problems, um, but just all the cold weather things, dogs staying out too long, cats staying out too long, coming in, their temperature's very low. Um, we'll see, especially with cats, with their little thin ears, if they're outside, they can get frostbite on their ears pretty quickly, and they'll come in and little pieces of their ear can, uh, can uh, necrose and fall off. So those are the types of things we worry about in the wintertime. Yeah, you know, dogs are tough in the wintertime, right? You know, they might have a little path to go out and go to the bathroom and not be able to run around and things like that. There's not as many other dogs that are out and about that they're interested in and, and chasing around at the fence line and things, so it can be difficult. I guess there's two things that I would do. If it's possible to find some type of indoor activity, some people, for instance, will teach their dogs to walk on the treadmill to get their exercise. Um, but if there's not, the important thing there is to cut back on their food so they don't gain weight over the wintertime. And they just say, hey, they're not going to be as active. It's not ideal but at least we don't have as much calories going in and, and they don't start out the spring then overweight and, and more likely to have some injuries and things like that. Cats are pretty easy when they're inside. You get a laser pointer or other little things to throw around for them, but it's hard to have your Great Dane uh, running through your house and smashing into everything, so that becomes a little more of a challenge. Thanks, Dr. Hood. Now let's jump on the other paw. Do you know the warning signs to alert you that your cat might have to go to the vet? Okay, we're going to talk today uh, about uh, monitoring your kitty cats at home and uh, the five things that maybe you should really pay attention to that would really help you know when uh, they're not feeling well and when you might want to take them to the veterinarian. So uh, we're going to use little Owl, the kitty cat here, just as a little demo for a cat, but uh, he's a little bit uh, wild, but um, he should stay pretty still. So, Well, the main thing I think that I always talk to people about, one of the more common uh, things that cats have problems with is um, urinary tract disease. And so monitoring their litter box um, is a very, very important thing to do. If we talk in just terms of general stuff, um, I think it's most important to have oh, one more litter box when you have cats. Um, that's a good ratio to know that you're giving them an adequate amount of space to use the litter boxes. So if you have two cats, you should have three litter boxes. And these really should be changed and cleaned every single day. And so we're really talking about scooping out any of the solid waste or any of the urine um, that's in there so that they have a nice, clean, a place to, to go to the bathroom at. And the other thing too, it allows you an opportunity to really monitor what's happening with that litter box. So um, cats going to their litter box real frequently, um, and especially if you notice that instead of being a lot of normal sized clumps of urine, you see a bunch of little small um, drops in there. Those would be key things for you to know that there's something going on. They have an increased urgency to go. They're only producing little bits of urine at a time. Those are things that should prompt you to make a phone call um, to the veterinarian to make sure that there's not a problem and issue and we would not need to see them in to check a urine sample on them. So monitoring that litter box habits is probably one of our number one things that we want to be uh, concerned with. The other thing that kind of fits with that a little bit is the water consumption. All right, I think I will, I will think you're done. You're going to go and uh, hang over here. He's just a little too wild, I think, today. Um, 
Water consumption becomes the other uh, big issue that we want to um, pay attention to with, with cats. Um, if they start drinking a lot of water, um, and will correlate with that, instead of being normal sized clumps in the litter box, is going to be real large sides uh, of, um, of urine in there. Those cats a lot of times can have kidney disease, they can have diabetes, and a variety of other things that could be an issue. So you really want to watch that water consumption and, and see what's uh, happening with that. Sometimes it's hard to just watch them, they'll just uh, you know, drink water when they want to, but you start noticing the water bowl goes down a lot quicker than it normally does, you should be um, worried or concerned about that. Um, the other big things we worry about is appetite changes. Now most people, this is common sense, oh my cat's not eating as much, they're not feeling well, I should be worried and concerned about it. But cats frequently can get uh, hyperthyroidism and those cats will actually start eating more than normal. That can be one of the very early on signs to watch for. So from a common sense standpoint, not eating as much, that should prompt a call to the veterinarian. But don't uh, hesitate with cats if they're eating a lot more than you think they should be and seem real hungry, especially if they're losing weight. Those could be hyperthyroid cats that need to be um, examined uh, pretty promptly to make sure they're not having any issue or problem. You know, cats, when they're not feeling well, will frequently hide. They'll find a closet underneath a bed, go underneath the couch, whatever else it happens to be. And this is a kind of survival mechanism. They're not feeling well. They don't want to be you know, obvious to a predator that they're not uh, well and could uh, be attacked pretty easily. So they find a place to just go and hide and uh, just kind of be by themselves and feel a little bit safer and more protected. So this should be a, a warning sign to, to you that if your cat is doing this, especially more than a day or two, um, and it's obvious to you, um, you know, that could be any number of things why they're not feeling well. Um, but that should be something that, that uh, alerts you right away to make sure that you go and, and get them checked out uh, pretty promptly. So we wouldn't want to overlook something that we could treat early on. Um, the other thing about it is just monitoring all the things that they do, You're just knowing what's normal for your cat. Um, do they normally not uh, lay in a certain place? How does their meow sound? Does that sound different? Their appetite? Are they limping on a leg? Any of those things that are not normal, at a minimum, just call the veterinarian, ask them if it's something to worry about. I get these calls all the time. Hey, is this, no, don't worry about it. We don't need to be concerned with that and we can resolve that on the phone. But sometimes it's going to be something that prompts something in our mind where we say, yeah, we do need to see them and make sure they're going to be healthy. And just remember, it's always easier to take care of those problems when they're early on and they're minor versus letting them go to too long and now they're much more sick and more difficult and expensive, quite honestly, to take care of. So um, just knowing what's normal for your pets and paying attention to these few pointers, I think you can make sure you get them in real quickly when they need to be seen. Happy New Year, Southfield. Ready to start off this year by getting a new best friend? Well, let's head over to Almost Home Animal Rescue League in Haven to meet some of their adoptable pets looking for their forever home. Hi, my name's Gina and this here is Mel. We're here at Almost Home Animal Haven in Southfield, Michigan. Mel is a four-year-old American Staffie. He's up in all the shots and he's also neutered. Mel's great with cats and other dogs, but needs to go to a household with older children. Mel loves to play fetch and he loves to run around in our big yard. Hi, I'm Gabby from Almost Home Animal Shelter and I'm here with Amelia. She's a two-year-old um, American Staffordshire Terrier. Um, she would do best being the only dog in the house. She's good with kids. She's potty trained. Oh. Amelia is up to date on all of her shots and she would be a great addition to any family. She's a one-year-old American Staffy. She's up in all of her shots. She does need to go to a household as the only pet. She's great with people. She loves to give kisses, and she loves to cuddle up on your lap. I'm here with the beautiful Wilma. She is a two-year-old American Staffordshire Terrier. She's very fun and playful. She's up to date on all of her shots, and she would make a great addition to any family. Lester, he's a five-year-old American Staffy. He's up in all of his shots. He does need to go to a household as the only pet and with older children, but he really is sweet. He loves to play fetch, he loves to give kisses. I'm here with Erin. She's a seven-month-old Labrador mix. She's a very sweet and playful girl. 
but she would do best as the only dog in the home. She does great with kids and cats. She's up to date on all of her shots. For information on her or any other animal, visit our website or give us a call. What a great group of pups, but remember, a pet is a lifelong commitment for both you and them, so make sure you're ready. Most dogs can live up to 10 to 13 years, and most cats up to 15 years. So, be sure you are fully ready for that new wonderful addition. Now, let's head down the road and meet our Detroit Zoo Wolf Duo. Family Wolf Wilderness, which is a wonderful two acre habitat, and we have our two gray wolves here, Wazi and Casca. Wazi's the female, she's about eight years old now, and Casca's our male. He is about six. Wazi's the bright white one that you see out in the habitat, and Casca's the dark one. The wolf habitat is over two acres, and it includes many outdoor open air viewing areas, up front close to close glass viewing areas, and also a beautiful warm log cabin where you can see the animals through the glass as well. In the log cabin we have a lovely um, phot photographic display that talks about wolves and their lives and their natural history, and it's a wonderful place to visit and learn more about wolves and warm up and enjoy your day here at the zoo. These two have been together for many, many years. They came from a zoo in Minnesota, and they came here to Detroit um, a little over two years ago. If people have been here before, this habitat used to be bison, and we did a lot of great modifications for the wolves. We did a lot of research on wolves and what makes them happy, um, what kind of things they enjoy, and they like to be up high, they like to have caves, they like to have water. These two in particular, in their home in Minnesota, were very fond of swimming. So we made sure we incorporated all those great habitat areas for them. There's lots of places to get shade, there's places for cover from people if they feel like having their privacy. Um, they can play in the waterfall, um, they can swim in the pool. There's all kinds of wonderful things for them to do in their two acre habitat. These are wolves, these are wild animals, and just like all the animals here at our zoo, um, we treat them like wild animals. We don't treat them like pets. We want them to behave like their wild counterparts in the zoo. So we certainly don't recommend a wolf to be in anyone's home. They're, they're meant to be in the wild. They're meant to be in the care of professionals such as zoos like ours. Typically females are considerably smaller than males. There can be quite a range, uh, age, a range of weight sizes. Our female here is probably about 60, 70 pounds, while our male is well over 100, probably more like 140. So that range between 50 or 60, well up into the 100s is not uncommon. They live in a group called a pack, and then there's typically an alpha pair, which is kind of the dominant pair. And then it's not unusual to have their offspring, perhaps of the last few years living together. And then the offspring will go out on their own. Depending on resources available in an area, packs could be just a few animals and packs could be many animals. They're very, very adaptable animals and if there are a lot of prey and a lot of resources in a certain area, it's possible that they could live in larger groups. We hope to breed them. Um, we keep a careful eye on them and we make sure the female has all the things she needs should she become pregnant. She has a nest box and a variety of places that would be cozy for her to make her nest and to build a den. Um, and we just keep an eye on them. Breeding season is the winter. Um, they give birth in the spring after about 60 days or so. So we keep an eye out and we're certainly hopeful. Well, here in the summer you'll see them start to shed their winter coat and the winter they get that thick heavy coat. The coat color can range as you see here from our animals from very light to very gray. Um, throughout the different seasons we make sure they, they have what they need to be comfortable. We make sure they have shelter away from rain or wind or sun. We provide bedding for them. They do have areas behind the scenes if they want to go to an indoor area. They have a lot of trees and deadfall and variety of places that they can dig themselves a den or find themselves a comfortable spot. These guys tend to be active more in the morning or in the evening. So I always suggest that people come see them early in the day or later in the day. Typically in the midday, especially in the warmer weather, they're just curled up taking their naps. Um, but they do like to play together. These guys are often playing. They like to forage, looking around um, 
their area for treats and for snacks. Sometimes I'll see them digging. They'll often dig themselves, if it's a warm day, a nice cool area in the dirt so they can take a nice afternoon nap in the shade. So when folks are here during the middle of the day and if it's a warm day, I always suggest that people look under the trees, behind the tall grasses, because sometimes that's what they'll be curled up. They're really a very social species, so uh, play behavior, a variety of different communication through um, visual cues, through body posturing, um, through howling, through grunting. There's a lot of neat things you'll see with these animals if you come by. If you make your way from the front entrance, it's, it's quite a bit of a walk, but it's certainly worth it. It's way in the back. We are open all year round. We are closed just three days a year, Thanksgiving, Christmas Day, and New Year's Day. But otherwise, we're open. This time of year in the winter, we're open from 10 in the morning till four o'clock in the evening. Um, the wolves are a wonderful species to see this time of year because they're still very active and outside. We have an indoor viewing area and an outdoor viewing area for the wolves. So if it's a chilly day, you can enjoy um, coming into our Cotton Family Wolf Winter Wilderness Cabin and warm up and have a wonderful visit with the wolves. There's a lot of other things here at the zoo and a lot of animals that are very active throughout the winter. Um, the wolverines, uh, the bison, the polar bears, um, sometimes you'll see the kangaroos. Uh, there's a lot of indoor habitats where you can visit our giraffes and our rhinos and our birds and our many amphibians and reptiles as well. And of course our brand new Pegman Center is a wonderful place to visit year round. Also, check out the Southfield Parks and Recs to get discounted tickets for the Detroit Zoo. What do you get when you combine dogs, cats, birds, reptiles, goats, bunnies, and humans under one roof for a weekend? The No Buy Pet Expo. People and their canine friends gathered for enjoyment to watch canine stunt dogs, performing house cats, and many more live animal acts. This expo is a lot of fun. There's always something going on from every corner. You go to one side, there's a dog group. You go to the back side, there's pony rides, there's dock diving dogs, there's agility dogs, there's cats twirling on hula hoops. It's just, there's everything for the family to have a whole day of fun. But entertainment was a second close to the show's most important piece education. People were able to ask questions and receive helpful information on pets, including some animals that they might not get to see up close and personal on a regular basis. Which turtle is for me? Can I really handle that snake? What bird best fits my lifestyle? We do a lot of events like this, and just by talking to people and getting people to ask us questions and answer their questions that they have, and we're willing to take people by the hand if they're interested in getting a bird and just take them step by step. The crowds are always really interested because these guys are really flashy and it draws people to them, and especially to our booth, but we also get a lot of good questions. And we do get a lot of people who potential adoptees, and we have adopted through uh, this pet expo in previous years a lot of birds that you know people don't know that that an organization like this is out there, and there is such a thing as as a, a bird rescue. We've been here numerous years. I think this is our fifth year now being out here. Last Day Dog Rescue specializes really in focusing on dogs that are um, usually five to ten days away from euthanasia. Uh, so we really pull most of our dogs from shelters that are very high kill shelters. Uh, we have about 200 volunteers, active volunteers in our organization. Uh, typically we have anywhere between 50 and 100 dogs at any given time. We are a foster based organization and we're always looking for new fosters. And uh, we also have cats. So we're a little bit of both and we've been around about seven years. And to date, we've adopted out about 6,700 dogs total. Um, and we love it because obviously everybody here are dog lovers. So for us, it's not always about just showing our dogs off and getting our dogs adopted from this event, as much as it is about getting volunteers involved, getting new fosters out of it, and just kind of spreading the word about why we're a little bit different than most rescues. Um, the difference with us and a lot of rescues is we're committed to our dogs for life. So in the event somebody wants to return their dog in a month or 10 years down the road, 
we take our dogs back, no questions asked. So we're a little bit different than most rescues with that. Um, and then the other thing is, is we do provide training for our adopters. So in the event that you do have behavioral issues or you're struggling, your dog's struggling trying to adapt to your home, you can talk to our trainers, you can come to our training classes and get free training as part of our adopting process. I would just say that it's a fantastic event. It's a great thing for rescues like us to kind of get out in the public and get our name out there and brand out there. And I would just encourage people that even if you have an hour a month, there's things that volunteer groups need and they need help with, not just our rescue, but any rescue or any volunteer group. So it's you know coming up to a new year and I would really encourage people to really think about 2017 and how they can make a difference in their community and, and to take a look at volunteering and get a hold of people like us and reach out to us because you'd be shocked at how much you can give back and it doesn't take a lot. We are so pleased to give you a sneak peek to some of these amazing animal acts and organizations that participated in the Novi Pet Expo. Be sure to watch out for future upcoming episodes of Animals Breed All About It where we dive deeper into getting to know some of these amazing animal lovers. Well, that's our show. Thanks for tuning in. If you have anything you want to see on our show or any questions, visit our Facebook page, Southfield Multimedia Services. And don't forget to come back for our next episode of Animals Breed All About It. Until next time.